Hi, and welcome. Thanks so much for coming today uh, to the webinar and taking time out of your um, schedule. Uh, so my name is Steve Allison. I'm from Build Exact. I uh, really want to, again, thank you for, for being here. Um, you know, we're at a time where there's so much uh, cost and margin pressure. Obviously, there's supply issues. And, uh, and really, uh, builders have never been under, you know, as much cost and margin pressure. And uh, one of the best ways, that, you know, we can help builders, obviously, is by reducing the amount of uh, costs and, and increasing that margin. Best way to do that, stop paying too much to the government. And, uh, and so what we wanted to do as Build Exact is really introduce you to some partners who can help uh, reduce uh, that amount of cost. And so exact accounting, by the way, uh, no correlation at all to Build Exact, just a coincidence in name, but they're experts in helping you um, reduce the amount of tax you're paying. So um, thanks for today. We just thought we'd put this on as a service to our builders. And I know today there's you know, a couple of hundred of you builders on, on uh, listening to me right now. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the experts in a sec. And the majority of you know who Build Exact is, but I did wanna just explain uh, just for those um, those builders who may not have heard of us before, really we do a few. We're a technology company. We're a software company. We do uh, three different things. Firstly, we help save time. So as opposed to if you're quoting a double story house, you know most people might take you know uh, between ten and you know up to forty hours to quote the house. I was talking to a builder the other day that does a complex double story house in two hours on our platform, just to give you an idea. Secondly, we help you win more work. And thirdly, and this is where this is coming from, we help you manage costs because it runs at not only from the estimation all the way through to managing jobs, and you can manage your costs and go all the way through to a zero or QuickBooks or a MyOb. So in that, um, that's always been our mission to help, you know, save time, help, help builders win work and help uh, manage costs. And so in that regard, we wanted to bring on the experts uh, from Exact Accounting to really help uh, you guys improve your position uh, in the market. So. Thanks for taking your time. One piece of housekeeping. Let's make this your session, right? Uh, I'd love you to just comment. And we're going to have a lot of um, uh, Q&A throughout the... We're going to have a, a lot of Q&A throughout the time today. And so you'll see Q, um, comments there, the comment section. Please go ahead and comment as we're going. Let's make this um, an interactive session. But right now, I'd like to introduce the experts. Uh, so Suze and uh, Josh from uh, Exact Accounting, do you want to bring on your video? Hey, guys. And uh, unmute yourselves, and I'll um, I'm going to hand straight over to you guys. Let's get straight into the action. Thanks so much for being here and taking your time out to um, talk to these builders today. I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, really great to be here, actually. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us on the session today. Um, as uh, as Steve was saying, we are an accounting firm. We're Queensland's leading building and construction accounting firm, and we've been working in the building and construction space for quite some years now and have seen a fair bit in terms of uh, where builders get it right and where they sometimes don't get it so right. Uh, and so we've got plenty of stories, war stories across the, the, the spectrum. Uh, and today we want to cover off quite a few different things with you. Josh is going to kick us off in a second and he's going to talk through not some specific tax issues per se, but some really critical things that we need to cover off on from a business performance and measurement uh, aspect of things. And then I'll kick, out, I'll kick back in with a few more key tax issues that we need to consider, not just this time of year, but all year round. But of course, critical this time of year coming into 30 June. We don't have a lot of time left, but there are still some things that we can be looking at between now and 30 June to help businesses get off on the right foot. And I guess, you know, I was meeting with a client just a couple of weeks ago. We've had countless conversations in the last few weeks around these issues. And one of these clients came in and was looking at a $100,000 tax bill without having a consideration for any of these type of options and strategies. And by the end of the discussion, we've been able to slash that in half for him. So he's facing maybe 50 now instead of the 100 if he'd waited and, uh, and not come and had a chat with us now and waited until July or August when he went in to come and say, here, can you do my tax? And it's a bit too late by then. So um, so the fact that you're here today is great testimony to, the, to you wanting to take some responsibility around these things. Hopefully you'll get some really great uh, ideas and some gems out of the session today. Uh, but you know, as uh, Steve said, plenty of Q&A opportunities. Use the chat button at the bottom, use the Q&A button and we'll get you through to your questions uh, a bit later on. But let's kick off now with Josh. Thanks, Josh. Lovely, thanks, Suze. And thanks again, everyone, for jumping on on a Tuesday afternoon. I know you've probably got a bunch of stuff you're trying to close out in the next two days for 30 June. So we'll keep this short and sharp and get into your questions as soon as we can. So what we like to do is sort of start off um, with 
you know, before before diving into the tax time gotchas, just wanted to sort of start by recognising that building construction businesses are actually a little different. And before I just keep going, Suze, have you? Yep, there we go. So building construction businesses are a little different. And they, you sort of have some unique challenges and opportunities. So, you know, what's actually specifically different? So look, the first thing is you guys start off with having quite long sales cycles. So you've got a bunch of time and money, blood, sweat and tears going into actually locking in contracts. So that's the first bit. And then once you've actually kicked off a contract, you've then got these large sort of cash flow fluctuations. And so it's typically heavy upfront cash flow and it's sort of lumpy throughout the project. So it takes a bit of bit of management. Now, and the other critical piece is that you actually, your projects run over multi income and tax periods. So you've got these, these sort of profit variations across years and, and then actually means that your tax issues across different financial years as well. So it's a bit sort of tricky. Um, and with it, it's actually tricky to measure um, building and construction businesses because they, they actually require a fairly disciplined accounting process. And one key element to that is this concept of work in progress, which actually really heavily impacts on measuring performance accurately and timely. And I, I will say Build Exact is a very useful tool of actually being able to build this discipline into your accounting as well. So we've got some sort of layers of complexity in your business as well. We've got pricing decisions you're making, uh, you know, what contracts we're using. We're we using rise and fall clauses. What, what are we doing with provisional sums? Are we using cost plus contracts? You've, you've got a lot, a lot of things to, balls in the air, you're sort of juggling to sort of get your head around it. And, you know, in some cases, like here in Queensland, just really quickly, you've got regulators like QBCC, which are a, a big old hurdle to jump. So there's a bit of risk in a building construction business, which can mean, as, as Steve was, was mentioning before, that it can be actually quite hard to hold on to your profit margins. Um, and so there's a bunch of moving parts, but this is actually not all doom and gloom. Um, if it's actually done right with the right people around you, these businesses can operate quite well. So that then comes to the next, the next point of, you know, accountants come in many shapes and sizes, but honestly, many won't see the unique nature of a building construction business because they are quite unique. And so what we commonly see is the, the financials, the books are prepared in a way that's easier for tax. But what it does is actually distorts the true financial position of the business and makes it actually quite hard to see how you're traveling. So the key reason why is that tax financials actually don't present true financial position. So what, what typically happens, you'll see profit looks low under tax financials um, and assets typically are missing in the books. Um, and, you know, we see that tax is the focus, but actually businesses don't operate on tax. Um, it's an entirely different world that business operates in, one key thing being WIP. Um, and again, it, it can sort of link into other areas like regulators or even dealing with eye care in New South Wales as an example as well. So the key is to get a specialist in your court. So with a specialist building construction accountant, we're more aware of both the tax and accounting issues impacting your business. So it's the concept that no, tax is tax and accounting is accounting. So what this means is, you know, we focus specifically on minimising the tax position, but also presenting the books in a way that is clear and useful to you as the owners or third parties as well. So the key difference being tax man wants the tax numbers, but you guys actually need accounting numbers to make good decisions for your business. And specialists can actually navigate that. Now, I do want to highlight that we're not the only building construction accountant in Australia. There are plenty of other great accountants that specialise in building construction. The main message I want to instill today, though, is that just make sure you've got the right accountant for you and your business that actually gets your industry. So, look, let's just jump straight into it um, and start with gotcha number one. So this is related to how we deal with purchases in the business and whether we treat these as expenses or assets. So it actually is possible to have your cake and eat it here. So... Look, there's a lot made of this instant asset write-off um, and you know, businesses love to claim deductions for things. Commonly though, we see the actual assets get written off in the, in the books, but this is actually not the way to do it. So writing off the assets distorts your profit and the value in the business. So it actually makes it quite difficult for you and other parties. So you might have banks, financiers, insurance companies um, looking at your financials and they won't actually have a clear picture because uh, all your assets are gone as, as one key thing. So our hot tip here with gotcha number one is, you know, 
best thing to do is keep the asset on your balance sheet in your books, but you still get the tax deduction. So the books in the tax return don't actually have to say the exact same thing. So a real quick one here, though, a, a reminder that this immediate asset write-off that we've been enjoying for years is actually set to finish 30 June 2023. So we've got another 12 months of being able to use this immediate write-off, but after that point, so from 1 July 2023, that threshold's going away and we no longer have access to this. And we haven't seen any announcements at this stage suggesting that that'll be extended. So make sure that you're aware of that. Um, We've also got a bit of a business hygiene tip here. So on your balance sheet, you really want to be making sure that the assets and liabilities that you're expecting to sort of receive or pay within the next 12 months are actually separated from those that you'll sort of receive or pay greater than 12 months. So the key reason why we have that separation is to actually make sure that you can get a read on your business and are you actually going to be safe in the short term, in the next 12 months? Can I sustain myself and can I pay my debts? So talking about hygiene and getting into good habits when it comes to a clean, useful set of books, we've got gotcha number two. Now, it's an area that's often overlooked and, you know, in some cases a complete mess is the way people go about calculating and actually booking WIP or work in progress. So WIP at a really high level is, it's a figure that rep recognises and represents the value of work that you've done but not able to be invoiced and in rare cases, paid for but not completed. So uh, it's it, that's sort of, you're left at the mercy of contracts in some cases of you haven't got to a certain stage claim yet. And so WIP tends to be a bit of a missing link in this. So typically WIP is an income item in the financials with a matching asset on the balance sheet. So I'm not gonna dive into the detail around how WIP is actually calculated for this webinar, but I just wanna to touch on it today because it is one of the most critical pieces to running a building and construction business. So. What you'll see, um, if you don't have WIP in the books, you'll see this sort of a roller coaster of your, of your figures month on month. So um, you'll see, you know, one month is a big hero month and then you might have a down month. And so if you average them over a few months, it might work out all right. But month to month, you have this sort of roller coaster. And typically the missing link in that is actually doing work in progress accounting, WIP accounting. So when you actually have WIP accounting booked in to your financials, it's it actually gives you a clear picture. So it can be, it's quite critical because it's not just you that needs to use the financials. It's quite often you, you'll be going using those financials to get funding. Um, and so banks, you know, when you've got clear financials, when, when external stakeholders are looking at them, they're much clearer and they actually show a proper financial position for the business. And so you probably sit there and you wonder, going, why is he talking about WIP on a tax webinar? Now, firstly, it's just one of those areas of building construction that every single time I have a, an opportunity to actually cover off on it, I take the chance to talk about it because it's just so critical to a building construction business specifically, and it's constantly done wrong. So my, my advice is get WIP in your books. Um, if you're not quite sure what, what it is, then obviously we, we can help with understanding that. I'm happy to talk through it further, um, but get it in the books and actually get it calculate correctly because you have start having a real edge on knowing your financials. So the other side of this though, the tax link to this is that if you get whip in the books and you're recording this income item, there's this mistaken thinking that it's actually, it's an income figure, so I pay tax earlier. I just want to quash that now so that's definitely not the case. If you've got a whip income item in the books, it is not a tax item. It does have no impact on tax whatsoever. Really high level, I won't, I'll touch on this, this really quickly. Um, in specifically my home state here of Queensland, um, you have to get these things sort of right specifically for regulators like the QPCC. And this also does impact um, other states um, as, as an example, New South Wales with their IK, IK insurance regime as well. So the key thing is don't underreport your assets, make sure that they're always reported correctly, recognize and book your whip in the financials have really good business hygiene around making sure that you're classifying things in your financials correctly. And the key thing is don't prepare your books on a tax basis. That's strong advice is just don't be caught out by those gotchas. And if you've got these hygiene measures in place, you're gonna have a much cleaner, much clearer set of financials. So I'm gonna shift gears now, that's a couple of gotchas, but want to shift gears and actually start talking about business structures and specifically 
family trust. So it's, they're a commonly used but often misunderstood structure is the trust. So what are the benefits of a trust? Two key ones. So they're good asset protection structures. Why? Because no one actually owns the assets in the trust. They're held by a trustee. So it's very difficult for someone to attack the assets of the trust. The second great reason is they provide good flexibility around spreading income and therefore tax across family members or those on lower overall tax rates. So great vehicle to use. But this tax is straight to gotcha number three. So at the moment, you, you may have heard, but trusts are a great structure, but the ATO have got their eyes set on them. So the best tax saver for years, which you've probably done this for years, is the ability to use adult children. So yeah, kids get to 18, they're not yet working, and they might be still studying. And common practice has been to distribute some income to them to you know use their lower tax bracket, um, but you actually don't pay the money to them. Now, and that's where the ATO have recently come out with an announcement of having a problem. So basically the ATO have announced that they've put a spotlight on this practice of distributing to the, the, your child, not paying them the money, but getting the tax, tax benefit. They basically are saying now, uh, really, if you're gonna do that, you really should be paying the money to your children. So there are still valid ways of actually distributing to adult children without necessarily having to flow the cash. But the key here is that you do need a good tax accountant to be across it and have a good strategy in place. So you absolutely need to have addressed it for, for this financial year. And I know we've only got two days left in this financial year, uh, but it needs to be addressed for this year sort of onwards. So make sure that you've, you're definitely looking at your trusts um, and not just blindly distributing to low tax individuals without having to think about it. So this is still an evolving sort of piece in, in the industry uh, and we're actually actively following it. Um, as, you, as you'd expect. So the final got you here, and I'll touch on this quickly because I, I realise that this is, we are an international webinar, but QBCC is, is the hardest regulated um, state um, around buildings. So the key thing is trust cause a bit of havoc um, with the regulator in QBCC. Um, the key issues that we, we typically have is a they don't, QBCC regulator don't recognize assets in a trust. So that in, in itself is a problem. So what that typically means is you have to use these alternative approaches and you end up having to stitch your personal assets to your license to make it work. And so that sort of undermines the whole reason why you have a trust in the first place. Um, but there's still also, you know, we avoid using trusts um, when trading in Queensland. Uh, but look, I'm not saying that if you already have a trust and you're trading in it, that you, you need to, pull that apart and that it shouldn't be used. The, the key thing is that you just need to know how to navigate it quite carefully to, to make sure you're meeting financial requirements. So any of these sort of gotchas, definitely reach out um, and you'll see our contact details at the end of this um, as well. If you're having any issues with your business structure or you just want a second set of eyes to go, is this the best way I should be doing it? Definitely reach out to Suzanne or myself and we can definitely talk further on it. So. I've covered off on a few areas here. So what we might do is we might take five minutes, Steve, to just open up the floor just for a couple of minutes, just for some questions, because you might have some burning questions sitting there already. Yeah, we, so Yeah, we had, an, uh, had a great question already from Slade, um, yep. Stanley. So was asking, look, what do you mean get WIP in books? We use zero. So would we have an income item for upcoming progress payments as WIP? What's your take on that? Yeah, so it's... Um, Basically, because what you'll see, um, Slade, is that you, you probably incurred a bunch of cost on a project, right? So you could have incurred 200 grand worth of costs on your project, but your contract actually hasn't let you get to the next stage claim. So you haven't been able to issue the invoice to your customer. So it, it's a good example around this time of year as the example. So you've incurred all this cost up to the 30th of June, say 200 grand, but you're only invoicing the client in July because you haven't yet been able to trigger that, that sort of billing point. So what WIP does is it, it basically books that revenue that you're actually going to invoice in July back in June to actually match the cost and the revenue together in the same period. And it's not a tax item. What it does, it just means that you're going to present more correct financial statements, right? So that's, it's a bit tricky, WIP, I will admit. <laughs> Yeah, WIP's one of those ones that needs a bit more detailed conversation sometimes, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, 
So I just want to encourage, um, you know, all the attendees, if you want to put your questions into chat, uh, we haven't got too many yet, so we, we can keep moving in a moment. Um, I'll give you, you know, like, let's say 10, 15 more seconds on this section, yep. whether you want to ask questions about trusts or about um, uh, the assets or the regulators that Josh has put up uh, and any more about WIP. I'll give you, a, let's say, another 10, 20 seconds. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so... Uh, Thanks that's for that. probably, yeah, that's probably right. You'll probably have plenty of questions flooding through the next section that Suze is going to go through as well. So if you're sort of on this bit, you're still thinking about your question, definitely throw it in at the end as well. So we might keep moving, Steve. Yeah, no worries. Um, so Suze, I might um, hand over to you now to take take everyone through the next, next few gotchas. Thanks, Josh. Um, Thanks, Suze. I will, yeah, here we go. So yeah, we're moving into the tax section now. I just wanted to run through a few key things that need should be aware of and as business owners, we should really be clear about. So gotcha number five we've got here is never be late ever. And what we're talking about here is your tax lodgements. And in particular, uh, a few key tax lodgements to be aware of. So superannuation is not tax deductible uh, and if it's not paid on time is the first key one there to, to note. So super is due the end of the quarter, but 28 days following end of quarter. So for our June super, it's actually not due for payment until the 28th of July. However, we can't claim the tax deduction this financial year if we pay it in July. So, uh, and it follows every quarter on the same basis. So your September super is not due until the 28th of October. You claim the tax deduction when it's paid. If you pay it late, it is never tax deductible. So it's really critical to make sure you're paying your super on time. And because it's uh, tax deductible at the point that you pay it, uh, it is critical if you want to bring the tax deduction into the current financial year that you make payment of that well ahead of the 30th of June. Now, we're at a critical point right now, 28th of June. It is quite difficult to get that through to the super funds on time by 30 June, uh, given that we do normally have to allow a few days clearing in that space. Uh, but you can look at using, uh, to have a chat with your accountant, you can look at using the ATO Clearinghouse to get that through a little bit ahead of time. Or if you have a self-managed super fund and the super you're contributing is for you, you may also have still a bit of time to get that super in. But that's a really critical one to be aware of is that super paid late is never tax deductible and it is a due date every quarter. It's not an annual due date there for super. Another key one to keep in mind is your TPARs. Uh, and they're coming up really soon. So your TPAR is your taxable payment annual report. They're due for lodgement by the 28th of July. And while there's no payment at all required on those, they are still a tax lodgement that is due. And I have started seeing the ATO impose late lodgement penalties where these are lodged late, in some cases up to $2,000 per return. So it is critical again to try and get these in and get them in on time. Uh, and your BAS is another one. A lot of people are not aware now that uh, if you're as is lodged late, your wages potentially are not tax deductible either. So that's another critical one. Our hot tip here uh, in this space, if you can't pay, lodge it anyway. You can always try and get a payment plan or a payment arrangement in place with the ATO, but you can never re-catch up that <laughs> lodgement if it's late. So once it's late, it's late. Um, so always try and get your lodgements in on time. And if you can't pay, set up a payment plan. A critical thing here as well, where BASs and super and these sorts of things are lodged late, the ATO is starting to impose uh, director penalty notices. And what that does is make you as a director personally liable for these debts of your business. So whether it's a company or trust, uh, you become personally liable for them where you've not paid it or lodged it on time. So it is critical to try and get these things under control and, and not leave them for late lodgements and so forth. So uh, yeah, hot tips. Uh, get it lodged and if you can't pay get it in and lodge it anyway gotcha number six uh, i know what you guys are like with your toys uh, we all have worked really hard for our money and we want to be able to enjoy it and so should we uh, there's nothing to stop you from looking at how can i claim something for as a business expense even if it has a bit of personal use in there there are some rules around that and we're going to talk through a few scenarios in a moment about those sorts of things um, i've got clients at both ends of the spectrum in this space so when you're looking at mixing business and pleasure what is and isn't deductible generally speaking and the general rule is uh, if it's a personal related item it's personal if it's business related it's business but there are those crossover times where you have to make some calls about is it or isn't it business or pleasure um, the first thing to note is it must be a genuine expense and it must genuinely relate to the business to be able to be claimed as a deduction in the business 
Second thing to note is the ATO is actually the judge of that, not you. So what I'm talking about there is the ATO has some very set guidelines in terms of when something may or may not be deductible for business purposes. And is those guidelines we need to follow. It's not us simply saying, oh, you know what, actually, I think it is deductible. That doesn't cut it. So it's got to be uh, within the guidelines that the ATO has in place. Worst case scenario, something goes wrong. ATO comes knocking on the door. You get an audit. Uh, and the ATO decides you got it wrong. You should never have claimed it as a business expense. You'll have to repay any of the, the claim that you've made that has to be paid back. There could be penalties and interest imposed as well. Uh, and the penalties can range from anything from 25% up to 200% of the amount that's been claimed. So there is a fair bit of uh, issue there. If there is something that goes wrong and an audit comes into play. Key tip, have a bulletproof plan for handling these things. So work out, how you go about doing this, when do you claim it for business, when do you treat the personal aspects and get rid of those, um, and stick with the plan effectively. I've got clients on both ends of the spectrum, some that will not put anything at all through the business that is personal, even the odd coffee, completely outside of it, paid from personal expenses, and they keep everything completely separate. And on the other end of the spectrum, I've had clients that have put everything through the business, all the groceries, all the uh, coffees that you like, everything just goes through the business. That's actually not wrong to say that you can't put it through. It is wrong to claim it as a tax deduction, but the business expense, sorry, the expense can still go through the business accounts. What, it, what that does is a couple of different things. It taint your business uh, in terms of the financials. So you're not getting a true picture of what the business actually is doing from a performance perspective. You've got a lot of expenses in there that don't relate to the business, which we then as accountants have to go through at the end of the year and pull back out for tax purposes. So it can be an uh, extra cost on your part in terms of the accountant going through and pulling all those things out and reviewing and recalculating. Um, and we've got to work out legitimately what is and isn't able to be claimed. So it is critical to work out how you want to run it. Um, the key is knowing what your plan is and sticking with the plan. So we're going to talk through a few different aspects of uh, where we do see these crossovers between business and personal. Uh, and hopefully you'll get some, a bit of an idea about what you need to do in each of these situations. So the first one, the home. Uh, COVID has taken a lot of us back to having home office or working from home. Um, even if we're working in our own business office, we still might be doing a few hours at home from time to time throughout the week. Um, so when can we claim our home? When can't we claim? What does it mean to claim? So there is a very clear distinction in the ATO between what we call working at home uh, versus working from home or that home office type situation. So the ATO has published a little bit of a guide in that space. So working at home, you actually don't have a dedicated space for this. You might be sitting on the couch using the, the uh, dining table, um, you know, borrowing the kid's desk, one of those uh, just to, to pop on and do a couple of hours or check some emails or those sorts of things. In that case, the ATO says you can, you can claim for those, that time that you spent at home. Uh, the most common claim we see in that space is what we call the cents per hour. So you're working at how many hours per week am I working at home uh, and using the ATO assigned rates for that. There's two rates that you can use. The 80 cents per hour, which you would have heard about, was a special rate that was introduced in COVID. That includes everything. So that wraps up your phone, your internet, your uh, electricity costs, all of those things that you have at home. So you cannot add anything extra on top of that. The lower rate, 52 cents per hour, covers just your electricity and utilities. Uh, you can then include on top of that your internet and telephone uh, and those sorts of things. So you've got to work out what's going to be better for you. I'd say with most of my builder clients, uh, 90 to 95% of them use the 80 cents per hour and just tell me how many hours per week they're working at home. Home office is where you've got an actual established place at home that is dedicated space. You've got a desk. It's not used for anything else other than you doing some work. Uh, and you can then extend the claim that you've got in that space uh, to include depreciation on your curtains and carpet. So if you can work out what that cost is. Um, but you can't still claim in that space occupancy expenses, which are things like your rent or mortgage. Uh, so the interest on your mortgage, your insurance and your rates. So that's where we have to look at what are you actually doing, working at home, do you have a dedicated home office, or do you even have a dedicated place of business? Now, when we start touching on place of business, this is more akin to it's the only office space I have, 
That's always where I go to do my business. I might even have staff working from that space as well. I may have converted my garage into my office. Uh, I could have a shed out the back that's being used as my office space. So where you've got that, that is absolutely a dedicated space. Um, and you, in this case, would be more likely to use our uh, floor square area as a basis for calculating your claim rather than the cents per hour that we use when we're just doing the work at home. So it's important to, to note the difference to work out which one is going to apply to you and how that's going to relate. Your accountant will be able to talk you through how that works uh, and which claim is going to work for you, as I said. Uh, the critical things at this point in the year is to work out your floor square area, so how much of the floor is used as that dedicated office space uh, versus the rest of the home. And then also looking at totaling all of those expenses. What's your electricity cost for the year? What's the interest on your mortgage for the year? Your rates, your insurances, all those things. So compiling that full list so you can then work out what the appropriate claim is. Now we're gonna step outside the home a little bit and talk about a few other areas where uh, this crossover happens between business and pleasure. So let's have a look at the garage or the shed. So we might have a shed out the back. Our garage space, as I said before, might be used as a home office. And that's fairly clear cut. We've set those spaces up and set them aside for home office space. But what if it's not just used for office? Or what if it's not even used for office? What if it's just storing my equipment, uh, some of my materials, uh, and those sorts of things? So in that case, we do still rely on floor square area, but we've got to split it between how much of that is personal, so what's storing the jet ski and what's storing the, uh, the old vintage car versus what's actually housing my equipment for work and materials and so forth for business purposes. So floor square area again is our mode there. Vehicles, very, very common. We see these all the time and most of you guys know this. Logbooks is critical when it comes to vehicles. Um, and your logbook, as you, you'd be aware, you need to keep for a minimum of 12 weeks and it needs to be 12 consecutive weeks. I hear you ask, I just bought a vehicle. I haven't had time. I haven't even had it for 13 weeks. What do I do in that case? You can start your logbook from now and you can still rely on that logbook for the current financial year, even if it spans over the end of the financial year. So don't stress too much. Get your logbook started and you'll be on, in good stead. Uh, the other thing uh, with your vehicles and keeping your logbooks is if you change vehicles after a couple of years, you don't need to redo your logbook if your pattern of usage has stayed the same. So that one logbook can carry you for quite some time. You do need to redo it every five years, um, but if you do change vehicles within that period, you you're pretty covered. Uh, the other thing with uh, vehicles, another one we get commonly asked about is trailers. Now, same thing with trailers as it is for vehicles. We have to look at pattern of usage and some sort of logbook that normally kicks in there as well. So is the trailer only ever used for work-related purposes? It's always got the equipment stored in there and the tools, or am I pulling stuff out of that and taking it camping every second weekend? So we've got to weigh up what is business and what is pleasure in that space and have a look at it from those perspectives. A couple of fun ones that we're starting to see more and more. I couldn't tell you how many times I've been asked about caravans lately. Um, people having to go away for work, interstate or out into regional areas and asking, rather than paying for accommodation, can I take a caravan with me? Um, the simple answer is yes, you can. And yes, the potential is there for a tax deduction. But again, your logbook is critical. So you do need to, again, maintain that logbook in terms of what is actual business use and what's you going out camping with the family every few weekends. Um, boats, unfortunately, uh, the ATO frowns upon those. It's very rare that we'd see those as a tax deductible item. Um, there are a couple of arguments that we can put forth where that might fly, but uh, it's a good discussion to have if you are thinking about that. We have had a couple of clients that work on some of the more uh, remote islands around uh, Brisbane and, the, and Queensland, and they've, the only way they've been able to access is a boat. And to save them costs, they've bought a boat to, to do that. And so there could be those type of nexus connections between income um, that would give them that right. But it, it, again, it's questionable. And most times the answer would be no for boats. More recently, I was asked about a plane. And if I did buy, a client said, if I do buy a plane and I have to fly between different sites, is it tax deductible? Same rules apply, logbooks apply. So we would still have to maintain that logbook, which as a pilot, uh, for any of you that are pilots would know, you do do that anyway. So it's not as difficult to, to substantiate and find that. Um, but basically, yes, planes are potentially in there. It just, again, depends on when it's used for business and when it's personal. 
So a few uh, critical tax planning tips this time of year. I've touched on super already. So if you haven't made your super contributions yet, you really need to get onto that now as in today uh, to make sure that that's going in by 30 June into your super fund and you can get that tax deduction this financial year. Uh, bad debts, it's also a good time to review those. So if you've issued invoices to clients and you're not gonna recover that money, it's becoming, unfortunately, a bit more common in the current climate. Um, so it's good to do a review of that and go through and say, let's write these off now. Um, and the instant asset write-off, Josh has already touched on that. Um, this one, really important to note on this one that your actual asset is not available for that instant asset write-off until it's actually ready for use. So if you've bought a vehicle, but you've not, it's not been delivered to you, you've not driven it out the driveway of the dealer yet, uh, you can't claim that this financial year. So it's at the point that you actually take delivery of it or it's ready for you to use, that it becomes deductible. And as Josh said earlier, we've got another 12 months in this space to take utilize, to utilize this uh, concession or this ability to write them off straight away. Um, and I've been saying to clients, that's going to require a little bit of planning, particularly in the current market where vehicles are quite difficult to get hold of. And there's a little bit of a lead time there. So in some cases, I'm seeing clients that it's, it's going to take them nine months to get some of their work vehicles in play. So you need to be planning that over the next probably three to four months to make sure you've got your order in and you can get it delivered before 30 June next year um, for next financial year. So, you know, a 12 month pre-planning tax exercise. Um, and I guess our hot tip on this one is if you don't need it, don't buy it. There is no point just spending money for the sake of spending money, particularly while we're looking at the current conditions that everyone's facing. Um, if you spend $100, it's only going to save you $25 in tax at the end of the day. So if you can't afford that $75, don't spend it. Keep your cash at the moment. Um, but again, if you do need it, if it's equipment that needs to be replaced or fixed or whatever, go ahead. Um, no issues in doing any of that. But it's definitely important to make sure that you are um, only getting what you need at this point in the year. Um, moving on a little bit, we just wanted to talk a little bit about different aspects of who does what in terms of this financial space and who's actually in your posse. It's important to have good advisors on your team. Um, a bookkeeper is a good bookkeeper is worth their weight in gold. And really, they're the ones that are going to keep that data churning in the background to make sure you know where you're at at any point in time from a financial perspective. So critical to have one of those in place. Your accountant, of course, taking care of all your compliance matters, giving you the advice that you need in those tax and more strategic space um, to really make sure the business is humming there. A commercial advisor or CFO advisory, which is what we call it in our, in our firm, um, they're the ones that really help deep dive down into the numbers. How am I making money? Why am I making money? Why did that job make money and that one not make money? Um, so really helping you understand those uh, more intricate details of how you're costing and how you're recovering on jobs. And then your financial advisor or your wealth management advisor are the ones that really help you work out how to deal with your profit. So once you're actually making money, you understand how to make money, they're the ones that will then help direct that in terms of your longevity and uh, moving you towards that uh, later end of life retirement and funding all those fun things and, and getting in that space there. Uh, another critical thing at this point of the year, point of the year, point at the moment with the economic climate the way it is, we're seeing a lot more businesses that are starting to struggle uh, and plenty of builders that we've seen already in trouble, some already going into liquidation and others that are probably teetering on the borderline of doing that. So uh, if you feel at all that you might be in that space, it's probably time to have a conversation. Uh, just because you're having a bit of issue or some cash flow crisis issues or any of those sorts of things doesn't mean automatically liquidation, winding up the company and away you go. Um, there are options. Debt restructuring is a feasible option. There's legislation in place around this. We're talking to clients about this at the moment, a few clients. Um, so there are definitely options in this space. Uh, and you might have heard of the small business restructuring, which um, comes into play in here as well. Um, the main thing is if you are experience any, experiencing any issues or trouble, don't bury your head in the sand. Um, put up your hand and have a chat with someone. It, it's critical to get advice earlier rather than waiting and uh, hoping to ride out the storm. In some cases, people can ride out the storm, but it might just mean having a good advisor in your court to help you with the strategies that you need to get you through those phases and those steps. So uh, next steps, I guess, oh, sorry, before we go to next steps, uh, we also are running an analytic platform. Uh, it's in 
uh, alpha phase at the moment. And uh, this is a zero build exact connection. And we're bring, going to bring deputy into the mix as well at some stage. Uh, if you are interested in having a look at this, this is a dashboard giving you real time data at the, two, the uh, touch of a finger. Uh, so you don't have to worry about, am I making money or not on these jobs? You've got that data right on your fingertips, um, right when you need it. Uh, so if you're already using Build Exact and if you're already using Xero, uh, that QR code there, you should be able to scan from the screen and just pop your details in and we'll put you in the waiting list and have a chat with you about what that means. Uh, and then where to from here? Uh, if we are offering a free 30 minute consultation for everyone on the webinar today. So if you are interested in diving into any of these details, uh, or going into any of this in a lot more detail, we will take any questions that you like for a 30 minute conversation uh, with Josh or myself. Um, that QR code on the screen will link you straight through to a page you can put your details in and we'll give you a call in the next couple of days and lock that meeting time in for you. Uh, and yeah, any questions at all that you want to just a bit more detail around your specific circumstances, I'd encourage you to book that in. Uh, we, you know, not going to step on your accountant's toes, but we certainly can give you some advice um, around what you could be doing or how you could be moving in the direction that you need to be going in. And I think we're going to open the floor now to any further questions. So I'll hand it over to Steve. Thanks, Suze. Yeah, I was, um, uh, I was amazed just learning a few things there. <laughs> your, your gotcha number five, pay on time. I mean, you know, I remember one uh, a while back and I'm sure many of the builders on would remember the same, you know, that... You used to get a little bit of a fine, but it wasn't such a big deal. Now they're, you know, it's non-tax deductible. So I really didn't realize that uh, on uh, on labor. Yeah. So um, guys, you know, obviously if you're if you're in that situation, make sure you get that. Uh, make sure you listen to that. That gotcha. That was a big one right there. Um, and uh, thanks so much for that, Susan. Look, there was another question that was already answered. Um, caravans claimable, um, which <laughs> doesn't surprise me. And obviously, I've got a a bunch of builder friends uh, that are, you know, telling me they do, do the same thing. So I think you've really answered some key pieces. Um, look, if, you, if you've got any more questions, I want you just to put it in the chat. Um, so see there's a Q&A in a chat, just please just drop it in the chat, um, you know, right now while we're talking. Um, while we're waiting just for one minute, uh, I do want to just put up a couple of different pieces. Number one, uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to just put up a little poll in front of you. And I'm going to do that now before the questions start flowing, simply because um, we can get that done really quickly. And that is, do you want someone from uh, Exact Accounting to contact you to pick up the phone and give you a call? And second of all, would you like someone from Build Exact to contact you? So again, this wasn't necessarily about Build Exact. Uh, I will uh, show you a couple of things for those of those are Build Exact users or even those who aren't on how to manage cost on our side uh, in a moment. Um, but first of all, I'll just put that in front of you so that we can keep going. So you can just respond to that for us. Um, I'll let you guys go ahead and do that. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'll, yeah, I was just amazed by that. Um, that was uh, um, that was quite amazing. Some of the, some of these pieces I, I learned a bit there. And logbooks, you were saying if you've done it, it was it five years, Suze? Yeah, you've done so it? correct. You only need to do it once every five years. The, the rule says unless your pattern of usage changes. Right. Um, so you know if you get a vehicle and you're really really active, going to sites quite frequently, and then of course if something like COVID happens where we're in lockdown for three months. So that would indicate a pattern of usage change. I know builders had a fair bit of um, leeway in terms of some of those lockdowns and were still out and about on site. So probably in their space, not such a big issue. But for some of um, some people would have been quite impacted by that and really should have been doing another logbook. But uh, and that's really just that pattern of usage issue. But it, otherwise, yeah, if you are still always the same sort of patterns, heading out to work sites fairly frequently, all of those things and nothing really changes, you don't need to do it for five years. And even if your vehicle changes in the middle, you can keep the logbook and just apply it to the new vehicle. So um, a lot of people think you keep have to do a new logbook every time you get a new vehicle, but it's not the case. So <laughs> I'm learning some stuff that I didn't have to do. So I'm going to change my pattern. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, we had a great question. What about logbooks for utilities and commercial vehicles? Um, yeah, really good question. So there is um, a little bit of guidance around minor and infrequent with the ATO in relation to vehicles and logbooks. And that's really a critical thing is what does minor and infrequent mean? Um, what minor means, well, it, it's incidental or it's not something that happens, uh, well, infrequent means it's not something that happens every every week or every, so if you're taking the kids to, to daycare or to school, that's considered personal. And if that's happening every day, that's not infrequent. So if you're doing that in your utility or in your, in your work truck, um, you really should be keeping a logbook um, to really show what is the business versus private use. 
Um, another one that we get frequently is, well, I, I don't take my truck home on the weekends. Great, perfect. You might be in the case for minor and infrequent. You drive your car to work site, you pick up your vehicle from there and then you use it during the day and then you take your own car home at night. You're probably fine, no logbook is likely required. Um, but if you then are taking the work vehicle out every second weekend to go camping, uh, or tow the boat down the river so you can go skiing or whatever it is, uh, you're probably borderline need to do that logbook because it's becoming less minor and infrequent in that case. Um, so the one-off trip here and there is not a problem. It's the, the frequency at which that happens that becomes more of an issue. So Suze, I think the question um, that, that's being asked in return is sometimes the employees won't tell you though, and how do you verify it as a, as a business owner in, on terms of your employees? What's your thought on that? Yeah, good question. There are some uh, documents that you can have your employees sign to say, uh, like a, 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 a declaration that they can sign that says that they only do minor and infrequent use in their vehicles. Um, I have got probably not as common, but a couple of clients that will actually not allow their employees to take the vehicles home. They must drop them off at the work site at the end of the day if they're not prepared to do a logbook. And so it's, it's a trade off. In some cases where they'll say, oh, you don't want to do a logbook, well, you can't take the vehicle home. You want to do a logbook, fine, I'll let you take it home. So some, some clients have gone to that extent and a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, and it, it comes back to you and your relationship with your employee as well. Um, and if, if they're not prepared to do a logbook, you might have to wear a bit of that cost. There is an alternate method you could look at uh, in terms of from an FBT perspective. Um, and that might be enough to get you through that. But uh, it's a conversation you need to have, A, with your accountant and B, with your employees about the best way to, to move forward in that space. Haven't we heard cases as well, Suze, because all of your vehicles are branded, right? We have heard these unusual cases with the ATO have actually got their eyes on branded work vehicles turning up at the beach um, a lot um, as well. I'm going, <laughs> yes. hang on a minute. <laughs> That's a bit of private use, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, be prepared to show them well, how you're doing your work while you're at the beach, um, well, <laughs> which site you're working at that day. Uh, so. make, make a long phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, so um, that, that's a yeah, great question. And I, I think, um, you know, maybe get in touch with uh, around the forms that, that Suze was talking about, maybe get in touch with Exact Accounting or, or your accounting firm on, on that as well. Great question, though. Um, another question, obviously, you know, you often have uh, Friday drinks with the team or you have a team drinks. Can you claim that? Yep. Josh, do you want to take that one? We're just going to say they're soft drinks, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it, it's quite simple. I'll keep this quite simple. The short answer is probably will be okay, but honestly, the actor really dislike alcoholic drinks as distinct from non-alcoholic. That's really how they look at it. So if you're going having a bunch of beers after work, they, they really don't like it um, and they sort of really, in, in most cases, they're going to call that non-deductible. Um, but if, if it was sort of, it was just sort of a bit quirky, I know, but it's, if you had a bunch of soft drink, then that's, that scenario could be well and truly different. So it's, um, it's quite plain in that, that case, non-alcoholic non versus alcoholic is actually the easy determining factor. And I think you could probably look at it too on the um, minor and frequent basis, Josh, because that, there's that rule that says that if it's under $300 per head and it doesn't happen very often, that you potentially could still claim it. And that's how Christmas parties normally are okay, yeah. is on that basis. So if it's every week that you're doing your work drinks, you might find that you're running into a bit of strife. But if you're only doing it every two or three months, once here and there, you're probably, you potentially are okay in that space. So. Very good. Well, I want to encourage you to continue to put your um, uh, questions in. We're going to um, uh, transition in just a moment. Um, uh, Suze, Josh, is there anything final you wanted to say? I'm going to show uh, a couple of things on cost on our side for those of those those who are build exact users or not, even not that matter. Um, but is there anything that you wanted to add, Suze and Josh? I think just a reminder that we do have a free consultation for anyone that would like to just flag some issues that are more specific to your circumstances. Um, we're happy to take whatever queries you've got in that space uh, and just set up a time to run through all of that. Or even if you'd like us just to have a quick look at your books and, and where you're standing, if there's any suggestions we can make, we're happy to have a look at those. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you are struggling, please reach out because there are some options available to you where you don't have to necessarily 
shut up shop and walk away um so you know and i know how hard that can be at times for business owners so and it, sometimes it's hard to ask for help but in these spaces it's much easier to do something if you ask early then wait until it's really blowing up in your face. So yeah, I'd say look, have take opportunity to uh, have that free consult that we're offering. And uh, yeah, thanks Steve for having us. We really appreciate yeah. the time today. I uh, hope everyone's enjoyed themselves and, and been able to get something valuable out of the session that we've done. Not a problem. Yeah. Thank you so much guys, really appreciate it. So um, guys that are staying on just for one minute, I, I do wanna um, show you one, one thing on our side in terms of managing cost. Um, so I'm just gonna start sharing my screen as well. And um, I'm just gonna flick over here. So for those of you who know Build Exact, you know that you go in and do the takeoffs and it runs your estimates, et cetera. For those of you who are on Build Exact, what you may or may not realize is two or three things. Number one, uh, in the current environment, definitely connect through to your, your favorite supplier. So go to integrations, connect through to your supply, get the latest update on price right there in your system so that you can keep the, um, uh, watching the margin on the items. And uh, you, you should be able to see these items come through. You can see this one that uh, comes from a, a group called ITM and it's uh, $7.7433. And if you wanna see the impact on a particular estimate of all the new price, you know, any kind of price changes and make sure you can manage margin, you just press this button here and it will show you in total across your entire estimate what the, what the difference is, right? Um, so live pricing is really, uh, kind of important. Secondly, connect Zero or QuickBooks or Myob into the system. And so what that's going to do for you is that when you're in here and you're now managing a job and it's created, it'll create all your invoices for you, create all your purchase for you, and you can start to see at the click of a button, right, the progress, the variance, uh, progress, variance, the invoice. And, and for those of you who, you know, most of you would know it, this will automatically create all your invoices into, into like a zero for you, for example, automatically create your, pat, your purchase orders if you're doing it here. And But you can start to get to a level of accuracy, dollars and cents accuracy it says, right, this particular item, because it came from that price list, um, has gone up this amount or, you know, any kind of variances that you can then go back and put in your template so that next time you do that estimate, you don't lose money, Right. Um, so I just want to encourage you with those two or three things. So the two or three things, just to repeat, connect through to QuickBooks Zero or uh, uh, Myob and use it and start using this from end to end. Number one. Number two, connect through to the, the integrated price files from your supplier, which gives you that, that level of granularity, um, A, in terms of the items and the, 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 the price changes, and B, going right through, all the way through to Zero QuickBooks and Myob. So just a couple of things there. Uh, for those of you who are brand new to this, this will tell you your progress, uh, help you manage variations, show you how much is invoiced and gross profit. And then together with the exact accounting dashboard that they'll talk about, just give you a really clear sense of how much you're making at any one time across all your jobs, but it's really only a few clicks to do that. So uh, happy to take any questions. So just double checking any other questions uh, before we close up today, uh, either for myself or for exact accounting, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, just double check if there's any others there. Uh, no, just people saying thank you and a uh, bunch of people saying thank you. So guys, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Uh, and again, just want to thank Exact Accounting for being here. Uh, and uh, please do uh, respond to that survey if you haven't already and we'll, um, we'll close that out. All done. Thanks again, guys. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Steve.